Hey guys, welcome back to the YouTube channel. Today I want to talk about you will own nothing and be happy. Now, what does that mean? When I talk about it, I mainly talk about physical media and I talk about how the industry is starting to become a, a beacon of you will own nothing. It's kind of like, oh, well, you don't have to own anything. You can just leave everything away. And it's a beacon of hope for some people. I can just, I can just switch off and my internet is my main thing and I can have a simplified setup and I don't have to own anything. I don't have to have anything. Some people like that. And I will agree that some people that works for, I mean, if you're in a small apartment living, it might be better to have not a big collection or kind of having a simplified experience to everything. But what happens when you purchase things on iTunes or purchase things on Google play or sign up to a subscription or like I'm, I'm signed up to Nintendo online and one thing that I get through there is the Game Boy games and it has to systematically check in to make sure that it's verifying my license every now and again. And it doesn't make sense that, I mean, couldn't they just program a date in, but I guess these are anti-piracy measures, but it just seems like we're getting to that point now where we're happy not to own anything and we're happy to, look, I'm... I'm a fan of preservation, and I've said that many times. I consider myself a librarian, as I wear my Hulk Hogan t-shirt. I probably shouldn't be wearing a Hulk Hogan t-shirt, but I did a, another video today, and yeah, it was about politics, about wrestlers picking sides in politics. Um, I'll put that at the end if, um, yeah, I'll put that as the end screen if you want to see that. But yeah, when I talk about physical media, I talk about something like you can actually pick your experience. You can own it. Physical ownership means that it's yours. You can't, I mean, look, people say, but the discs rot. Yeah, eventually, look, everything has a shelf life. Everything will eventually meet its shelf life. Everything will eventually fall apart. Everything will degrade over time. Now, obviously, there's CDs from the early 90s and even the 80s that still play. You know, there's tapes that still play. There's so many things that still work. So when it comes to shelf life, it's subjective depending how you store it, depending how you look after it. There's a lot of variables to that. But when you talk about streaming, we've seen stuff like the PlayStation outage where people couldn't access their games, games that they actually owned, they couldn't access. Steam has some issues from what I've heard of Steam games have been taken away from people. And you might think, oh, well, but I'm okay with that. It's Steam, it's anything. But what happens if you buy a game? Like, let's say you bought Concord on the PlayStation, for example. And then PlayStation said, you know what? We're not happy with this game being out there. Let's pull it. And what happens if you didn't have that on physical media? What happens if PlayStation said, remove it from every PlayStation right now, give everyone a refund and remove it? Now, obviously, people might say, oh, well, they're giving us a refund. Okay, whatever. But what happens if you have preservation? What if you liked that game? What if, I mean, look, I don't know if that's, they refunded anyone over that, but I've been looking at Concord the past week and I've been really thinking about, like, should I go out and buy it? Like, part of the thing that about me is... I kind of do want to preserve some things. So like, I want to find an original disc out there in the wild from Cyberpunk when that first launched. And that's really hard to find because most of the copies out there are replacements and it's hard to tell the replacements from the original disc that had 1.0 on it. And look, say what you will about Cyberpunk, but it has made a lot of ground in fixing a lot of the issues. But I still think preserving it in its original form shows for future generations, how broken it was when it was shipped. It can be a museum piece. It can show like, hey, one day I could say, hey, try playing Cyberpunk. Look at how broken it was and then see where it is now. Like, it can be like a throwback of sorts. And people might say, but I don't care about that. I just want to play Cyberpunk. Well, that's fine as well. But I choose the physical ownership route because I like to own things. I like to have things. I like the ownership aspect of collections or whatever. Whether it's gaming, whether it's movies, whether it's music. I spent most of my day today ripping CDs to a MacBook so I can put them on with my phone. And I'm doing it in Wave and people say, oh, you shouldn't you do a FLAC file or something so you can put it on the iPhone and save room? I was brought up with Wave and I don't really care about FLAC. I don't really know any of these things. I just know Wave was the best of the time and yeah, it's bigger files. But I mean, when my phone's one terabyte now, I'm not really stressing over a little bit of extra space. It's like... I've probably got like a couple of dozen CDs, maybe a maybe hundred at most. And I had a bigger collection back in the day. I've got a hard drive that has about 400 gigs of WAV files on it from my original collection. And I just don't, I just want 
my collection to be a reflection of what I'm listening to at the moment. And I've got the CDs on the shelf over there, which I've cleared some room over there. I will show it in a later video next to my DVD collection. I've been doing a big rearrangement. But when I think about it, owning physical is a way to like, okay, let's say, let's say my MacBook stopped working. Let's say, Mac, let's just say um, I couldn't put that music onto my iPhone anymore. There was some sort of block in place that said, no, you're not allowed to put this music on. It's copyrighted music. You're not allowed to do that. I still own the CDs over there, and as long as I rip them through another format, rip them through Windows Movie Maker, or what, I don't know, is Windows Movie Maker still a thing? What is it? Windows Media Player, that's what I'm trying to think of. But Windows Media Player might rip them in Wave, and then I can put them on through uh, VLC or something. But what I'm trying to say is, like, I own the format, I own the CD, and you might say, oh, but hard drive, you can put it on a hard drive. Hard drive fail too. And also, I like the experience of having it on the disc and having the artwork and having the actual experience of holding physical media in your hands and saying, I own this. I like to be able to say, you know what? I'm going to pick up Millipede. I own this physically. It's mine. It's a physical cartridge, something I can hold, something I can see, something I can resell, something I can give to a friend. It's mine. And that's what I like about it. But this whole dilemma of you will own nothing and be happy. I don't like where the world is going. And I don't like how we're just going along dandy with it all and just being like, yeah, well, I guess that's the way to go. Ha, 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 ha. It's like, if we were 10, 20 years ago and we said, you will own, you will not own your favorite movie. You will not own your favorite song. You will not own your favorite game. You will be paying monthly. Or let's say you bought, let's say you did that purchase. If we said, oh, but, you, you can buy that purchase, but, oh, the studio just said, oh, it's got a glitch. They're pulling it from every shelf, every game collection. How angry would you be if, let's say, Manhunt got banned in Australia. Obviously, one of the games, Rockstar Games, got banned in Australia. And there was a game out there. It did get an initial release in Australia before it was banned. But let's say you liked that game. And then suddenly, they were saying, oh, it's pre-installed on hard drives, but the Australian government just banned it. So we need to pull it from all PlayStations in Australia. What would happen in that day and age where they said, we're going to refund you the money. No worries. Like, no worries. We're giving you the money back. That's not the point that they're giving you the money back. The point is that you liked that game. You made the decision to buy that game. It still works. There's nothing wrong with that game. It's just that it's being banned in the country. But you purchased it. You thought you owned it. But obviously you didn't own it. You owned a license. You owned a rental, a long-term rental that they could take a few at any given time. Now, obviously, Manhunt did come out in Australia on physical media. So there are still versions of Manhunt in Australia where you can get it on PS2. There are still versions out there. I have seen it in game stores. But do you understand what I'm saying, how physical media does protect? And yes, look, I think that it's not just physical media. It's not just CDs. It's housing as well. So many of my generation, millennials, are in the dilemma now where we can't afford to buy a house. It's getting to that point now where there's so much wealth at the top end, like the older demographics, and not even the older demographics. I know some older people struggle to buy a house and get forward. I mean, there's a lot of people out there struggling at the moment. But just the money seems to go to one sort of, the most wealthy of the 1% of the country, the most wealthy 10% of the country, whatever it gets to the point where there is a big generational gap and a big a big amount of space where a millennial might not be able to buy a house. We might be able to buy an apartment, for example, but we can't buy a house. Now, I don't own the apartment I'm in, but I am looking to buy eventually. And I know that dilemma of, well, if I was going to buy, I might have to move out of my city, which is Sydney. I might have to go inland. I might have to move inland or something, move into one of the regions where there is not a lot of infrastructure, where there's not a lot of business to work for. There's, I mean, there's mining corporations and stuff in land, but I don't really see myself working for a mining company or whatever. But this dilemma of you will not own a house, you might want to own a house, but rental is better for you. You know, rental, you can, rent, you can rent and you can be in the city you like, and then you spend the next 30 years paying for someone else's investment. And that's streaming services in how I see streaming services. You are paying for the corporation over, over, over. And you might say, oh, but I own mine. I owned it. I bought it on iTunes. Well, what happens if iTunes comes out with the 8K release and says, oh, by the way, we're not going to do what we did with 4K. We're going to actually charge again, but 
it's going to be so much better that you're just going to want to buy it again. Or if it's not, it's a streaming service. We're just going to keep you ongoing. You'll have access to the movies, but it'll be ongoing. So you'll have access as long as you pay the subscription once a month. Subscription services are rentals. And you might say, okay, but whatever. Look at the subscription model that used to be implemented at places like Blockbuster. And look at how it used to be implemented at Video Easy and all these other big businesses, all these other rental stores. Hollywood Video, Civic, you know, there's all these rental stores that will use, okay, rent it for a week, bring it back, get your next bunch. That's how sort of streaming are. Here you go, have access to everything you can think of, and then come back next month, maybe watch some more, or, you know, sometimes some people can cancel. And can go, okay, we'll go away for a month, go and watch another service, then come back and watch Stranger Things when it's on, or come back and watch The Boys when it's on. Come back, we'll have you back. That's how I see it going, and... Look, they're eventually going to introduce yearly subscriptions where I think monthly is going to go away. I think monthly is going to be a thing of the past where you'll have to sign up for a year. It'll be monthly recurring, but you will need to log in for a year. I think that's going to be the way it goes. Sort of like a phone plan. And I think I think phone plans have an out now because we've issued a lot of legislation in Australia where you can't actually do 12-month plans and log in. Now, obviously, you can't lock in at a price, but they can't lock in and so say you can't leave. I think that's kind of illegal now in Australia. But the idea that we will own nothing, we're going down our house, we can't, we can barely buy, buy food. Some people can barely buy food. Now, obviously people say, but you're not struggling. Obviously I'm not struggling. I mean, I buy physical media, I'm not struggling. But there are a lot of people struggling who might say, oh, well, DVD is so terrible. You do not buy DVD. And 4K, this is the best it's ever looked. And if you don't have the 4K, why even bother? Well, that is a shitty way of thinking about things. If you can barely afford food, don't run out and buy the 4Ks. Don't run out any. Don't even run out and buy the Blu-rays unless it's cheap enough. Unless you can get like your favorite Blu-ray for like two or three dollars. Go out and get the DVDs for fifty cents or a dollar at the Salvos or whatever. It's just you know we're in a cost of living crisis and we're starting to be programmed to not own anything, not worry about anything. I've seen. I'm really big against this Azempic thing. I. My doctor has very recently told me that I should probably be on something like that. And I have refused it many different times. <laughs> kind of stubbornly. But <laughs> I am of the mindset of, well, of course I'm going to lose weight if I don't eat. And I've had that whole moral dilemma. And I'm not going to go into it because my doctor is a very good person. And I do trust my doctor. And he's giving me the medical advice saying, yep, we should go this route. And I'm still fighting the morals in my head of like, well, I don't know. I mean, shouldn't I be able to do that on my own accord? I mean, I know some people struggle with weight loss. I know that is a very big issue. But to take something that will make you not want to eat, I don't think that's the right answer either. And that just doesn't sit well with me. I mean, yeah, look, I've never, I'm like Freezer. I've never tried to train the day in my life. I mean, yeah, I've trained in like gaming and buying and all this other stuff, studies and whatever, but I've never actually trained. I've never been into a gym. And to suddenly say, oh, well, let's go a Zempic route. I don't think I need to go that way. But it's getting me reliant on something that I probably can do outright if I tried. And yes, people might say, well, why don't you try? Because I'm happy with who I am. I'm happy with my body. I'm happy with who I am. And I don't think I need to be introducing something that would otherwise impact me health-wise or impact my reliance on something. I don't think I need to be doing that. And yeah, I'm not going to go down that route too much, but the other thing I'm saying, like, I don't think that we need to be willingly going towards the streaming model. We don't need streaming. We had a very good system, and you might say, but you have a big collection of whatever, and not everyone can have a, a room full of Blu-rays. I get it. I very, I understand you. But what happened to just having a, give me two seconds, what happened to having something like this? Let me just grab one of these. What happened to something like this where you'd have like a little case, like a, a little case and you could put like however many discs in it. Now, obviously, I've got just a PlayStation VR thing in there. But what happens when you used to have CDs in here? Now, obviously, I've got nothing in there because I don't like to keep them in there. But what happened to these sort of things where you could actually put them all away? Let's say you didn't care for the case. Let's say you didn't care for any of that. You could just get your favorite CDs and put them in here if that's your route to go. And as long as it's your favorite songs, and you might say, oh, but I want to listen to that one song from Britney Spears or whatever. It's like, yeah, well, if you want to go that route, that's how you experience it. But 
People will say, but I have a hard drive full of movies unofficially. <laughs> yeah, well, we know about we know about the bay. We know you you're in every comment section on YouTube and on Reddit and everything. We know about you. We we acknowledge you. We see you. Okay. <laughs> we know you get it all for free. But let's say you wanted to support the industry. Let's just say you wanted to go out and buy a CD or buy a Blu-ray and support the industry. I mean, you know, it's money going back to the industry. People complain about, oh, well, they don't make any good movies anymore. And I, why would I go and watch this? They don't make anything good anymore. But then they'll download it and it'll show like, okay, it's getting downloaded, but no one's going to see it. So like, why would we put more money into that? Like, we don't know where our investment is coming from. And it might work for some movies where that are just terrible, but... Yeah, I just think, like, I, I, I heard support. I know people have asked me, oh, Jamie, you did a, voc you did a video on Joker 2. Oh, uh, Joker, yeah, Joker 2. And are you going to buy that? I bet it'll be in your collection. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, I'll analyze that when I come to it. My options are I can rent it for $30 or something, $20 on iTunes and have it for 48 hours. I can buy it outright for, like, 30 Or I can just buy the 4K Blu-ray one sale for, like, 32 and own it outright. I know which choice I'm probably going to choose, and you might say, but the bay. I don't want to do that. I don't want to go that route. And you might say, well, I thought you said you're not the core demographic. I'm not the core demographic, but as I said in my previous video, one of my previous videos about going to the cinema and how it's pricing people out, I believe, on a curiosity, I might just want to check it out, and I might be happy paying for ownership, saying, oh, well, I want to check it out. It's a bit cheaper. I mean, I might get it on sale for like $28 or something. $32 if it's $40. Because I'm going after JB Hi-Fi sales when they have like 20% off or whatever. Usually if it's $40, it'll be down to like $32. And usually if it's like in the $30 range, like $32, it'll be down to like $28 or something. So I can pretty much line it up and say, okay, I can probably get it for a bit cheaper when it's on sale. And I might get it on the whim. I might go, you know what? I should probably give it a chance. I mean... I mentioned it in a previous video that I had not watched Aquaman. I hadn't even watched Blue Beetle yet. I haven't watched, uh, what's it called? Uh, Shazam 2. Like, there are so many movies I haven't watched. Now, obviously, that's a steel book. And I liked the first Aquaman movie, but I heard such bad press about this that I was like, you know what? I'll wait till it comes to Blu-ray. And then when the Blu-ray 4K comes out, I bought the 4K Blu-ray. And that's on my shelf. You might say, but it's still sealed. Why do you have it if you're not going to watch it? Why do you have all these Blu-rays that you just spend money on? Well, obviously, I have it there. And I bought it on a whim. I probably got that on sale. I was probably like, you know what? I'll have it there for ready to go when I'm ready to watch it. I mean, as I said, my options are buy the 4K Blu-ray, have it in as another title on my shelf ready to go when I'm ready. And I'm picking these on sale, obviously. That's a steelbook, a limited edition steelbook. Or I could pay, what, $20, $30 to stream it? And you might say, but wait till it gets to HBO, or wait till it gets to Binge. Well, then that's just a subscription. I'm paying $20 to a subscription service to watch it that one time. It's still the same. It's like, yeah, you might say, oh, but you can watch it. You just want to watch it. What happens if I like it? What happens if I want to watch it over and over and over again? Or what happens if I didn't like it? In the case of old, uh, M. Night Shyamalan. I've mentioned that on my horror section as well. I can see it right there. And I said, you know what? I didn't like that movie. I had to, I struggled to sit through it. I had to watch it over three viewings. I had to watch, split it into parts and watch it. But I'm still going to have it on my shelf because maybe I lighten up to that movie. Maybe I watch it again. And I'm like, you know what? I was a bit critical that first time. Maybe it was the viewing. Maybe I was just in a bad mindset. Maybe I was a bit tired. I mean, here's one for you. I didn't like Tarantino movies for the longest time. And you might think, film buff, how did you not like Tarantino? And I always gave him credit for Pulp Fiction. I was like, you know what? Pulp Fiction's a good movie. I'll give him credit. Reservoir Dogs as well. I gave him credit for that one. But like, I didn't see Jackie Brown. I, I saw Jackie Brown, but I didn't understand Jackie Brown. I didn't understand Kill Bill. And I still haven't rewatched Kill Bill since probably 19... When did, when did it come out? 99 or 2001 or something? I haven't watched Kill Bill since. And people might say, you should go back and watch it. And yes, as I've grown older, I've understood a bit more about like, why Pulp Fiction's so great why Jackie Brown's awesome. Like, there are so many aspects of Tarantino movies that I didn't appreciate when I was younger. And we might look at M. Night Shyamalan in 10 years and say, he was revolutionary. He was so good at what he did that we weren't ready for it. I mean, you can say what you will about Tenet, but some people have even lightened up to Tenet now, and I still am struggling to see what the point of Tenet was. Uh, um, Christopher Nolan. 
But I am of the mindset that, okay, maybe with fresh eyes, we can get a new perspective on it. And it's in my collection, yes. But I know this is a bit of a ramble, this video, but do you understand what I'm trying to say? Like, I'm of the mindset that ownership is the way to go. And I'm of the mindset that I want to own stuff. I want to pay a bit extra and own it outright. I want to have it in my collection. I want to have it ready to go. Some people might disagree with me and say, oh, you should just get it when you want it. But then you're still paying for that. You're still paying for that service at the end of the day anyways. People might say, but, you know, you should, could have just streamed it. Streaming costs money. You want to own it on iTunes, it costs money. Everything costs money. And at least with mine, it's a physical asset on a shelf that I can resell. Like if I have Aquaman there still sealed, let's say I hadn't watched it, I haven't. It's still sealed. I could resell that if I get desperate and say, you know what? I won't get the exact same amount. It's a limited edition. I could probably sell that for like $25, $30. But do you understand what I'm saying? Like it is an asset. I can resell it. It's like something I own. And not that I'm going to do it. I mean, I like my collection. But yeah, I mean, you know, this whole point I'm trying to make is that I like to own things. I like to do things the way it's intended. Like obviously I mentioned a Zempic a tiny bit earlier. I don't feel like a Zempic is the right way for me. And that doesn't mean I'm going to run to the gym and start working out and being like healthy straight away. It's like, no, I understand who I am. I understand what my limitations are. I understand what I like and what I want to do and how I want to live my life. Now, obviously, this is how I choose to live my life with physical media. It's not for everyone. I know people will struggle for room. I understand not everyone's going to do that. But you have to understand that everyone has a choice. My choice is to continue physical media and continue going down this route. It's not as much as I spent in previous years. I've been very cautious of how much I buy this year. But it's not necessarily something I'm opposed to. It's not something that, you know, if I see a big some uh, Columbia Classics 5 coming out, I'm probably going to get Columbia Classics 5 and spend a bit much on it than I probably should. But at the end of the day, like, I'm still going to buy it. And it's my choice. And that's the best thing. Isn't it so good to say, it's my choice? Instead of saying, well, I had no choice and I just had to get on binge to watch it. I had no choice, so I just had to buy it on iTunes. Isn't it so good to say, you know what? I actually wanted to have Aquaman. I am going to actually watch it at some point. It was my choice to go out and buy that. It was my choice to leave it on the shelf sealed that to when I'm ready. It was my choice. And I love that feeling of just saying it was my choice. And it's not everyone's choice. People are going to choose to pirate it. People are going to choose to go streaming, streaming services. People are going to choose to buy it for iTunes. All of which are your choices, your personal choices of how you choose to. And yes, you might say that is a choice. Well, yes, that is a choice. But a lot of the times when people say, oh, I'll just wait till it gets to HBO. Really, you have no choice than what HBO give you. Let's say it's not the right version on there. Let's say there's two versions of Justice League, for example. Let's say they wipes the... Um, the Snyder cut off HBO Max and binge and all that, and said, you're only going to watch Justice League, the initial cut. You might say, oh, well, we just won't have binge then. Well, what happens then? Like, what if they have to remove it from all the online services? I own it in my collection there. I can watch it. I have the choice to watch that movie. If it's pulled from online, you don't have the choice. And you might say, but what if the disc rots? Well, yeah, that's your dilemma. Anyways, guys, let me know what you think. Am I just ranting at this point, or am I actually speaking some truth here? Tell me, I'll do a CM Punk quote. Tell me when I'm telling lies. And I am not telling lies. That is just how I feel about it. I feel like we are being programmed to not want to own anything. And that is just something I'm not for. I, that is something I'm very much against. I think ownership is part of the joys of life. And yes, you might say, but you're being programmed consumerism. Yeah, well, that's, that's what you want to say about me. Fine, that's what your thoughts are about me. But I am of the mindset of it's such it's such a good thing to have a choice and it's such a good thing that I choose to collect physical media. That is my choice. If I'm on digital, I would have no choice but to choose the versions they want to give me, to choose how they want me to consume. Let's say it's a long-term rental. Like you cannot, I don't believe you can buy Stranger Things on an iTunes store or Google Play store. I think the only way you can watch that is to rent or sign up a subscription for Netflix. And they used to do these box sets. I can't, I don't know if you can't see them behind me up there. But they used to do these box sets up here. Where, uh, long after the thing, they'd have these Stranger Things box sets. And they don't do them anymore. They haven't done them since season one and two. 
because they want you to get on Netflix. They want you to get that service. Come right back here. Anyways, guys, let me know what you think. And I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.